Thank you, uh, Chimai. Uh, I am Thomas Michael Swenson, and an assistant professor at the Division of Ethnic Studies in the School of Cultural and Social Transformation at the University of Utah. It's a great pleasure to serve as the Katrin uh, H. LeMond Scholar in Residence this year on campus. The residency is an honor and a highlight in my scholarly career. I'd like to thank the staff at the School for Advanced Research for their hard work and generosity of their time in helping me settle in here to life in Santa Fe, to President Michael Brown and the Board of Directors for their service and leadership to the school, and to all of you in attendance here today. Thank you for coming. Kuyana. Today's talk comes from my current book manuscript entitled The Great Land, The Environment and Belonging in Native Alaska. The Great Land argues that Alaska is built upon a tradition of indigenous people compelled to work in natural resource industries that have a history of adverse effects on the environment. Beginning in the 18th century, Russia compelled Alaska natives to serve in extractive industries under dire conditions for both native culture and for ecosystems. Upon selling the region to the United States in 1867, neither nation recognized indigenous sovereignty. Instead, the U.S. naturalized natives into a piebald form of res residency where their belonging to the United States was based upon their history of compulsory service. Native labor and the industrialization of natural resources combined to form Alaska as a political and economic entity. The book, The Great Land, The Environment and Belonging in Native Alaska, employs archival sources, writings, and performance studies to consider native belonging to the nation. The talk today comes in three parts. The first will elaborate on the book's narrative of belonging and the environment. Then the second part, I'll turn to our attention to passive passages from uh, the chapter Extraction Standard Bearer for a deeper examination of how the flag embodies themes uh, of belonging and environment for indigenous culture. Then in the final few moment, moments of the talk, I will conclude with a summary of the Great Land's uh, closing segments. The name Alaska derives from the uh, uh, Unagon word uh, alias Gak, that has been generously translated into English as the Great Land. While the word Alaska is the anglicized transformation of the sound of the word, the term the Great Land is the literal translated meaning of, al of alias Gak, which is the object to which the sea is directed. In the 18th century, Russian functionaries adopted the word Aliaskak from islanders along the Aleutian chain. So you can see that the meaning reflects the indigenous understanding of the North American continent. Uh, Rus Russian business interests subjugated indigenous populations whom they call Aleut within gendered coercive labor regimes for over a century of intense occupation in the southern part of what became Russian America. The initial period of colonization of Alaska, followed by the United States annexation in 1867, bound indigenous people to extractive markets that have endured for close to 300 years. The modern conception of Alaska grew from relationships between natural resources, the tradition of flexible native labor, and extractive economies through which natives live lives without indigenous rights, bound to labor systems, uh, in this book, the, the Great Land carries the history of Russian economy in accordance to uh, the following U.S. expansion because this industrialization existed before the nation purchased the territory and lent it the name Alaska. Using the title The Great Land, for the book is a way to describe the region with a native cultural meaning that is beyond the confines of the nation, since it draws from the original essence of the native word. In doing so, the book's contribution focuses on Alaska natives as central to the economic and cultural advancement of the state. The Great Land, in this way, mends Russian and U.S. history of Alaska through native experience of compelled belonging. The chapters of the Great Land narrate an Alaska Native history suturing Russian and U.S. occupation into one. Beginning with an examination of the documentary film Our Aleut History, Alaska Natives in Progress by fellow Aleutic Judy Ann Peterson that I unearthed by accident when I was in graduate school. 
made, by an, made in the early 1980s for a college thesis project as part of a bachelor's degree at the University of California, Santa Cruz. The film on VHS tape ended up in an unmarked envelope at an archive at the University of California, Berkeley. Made before the widespread use of the internet, Peterson drew from modernist anthropological studies and conducted interviews with Alaska natives to place them at the center of a, rush, of a Russian and US history. The film grapples with the nature of the compelled belonging that has left a legacy where material culture has been looted and cultural practices have made, been made forbidden. As the title suggests, Our Aleut History, Alaska Natives in Progress, is about merging the Russian past with the United States present. Aleut is a term applied to people living along the Aleutian chain, and the term Alaska Native is, a, is an umbrella phrase used by the United States to categorize up to 20 distinct language groups of people who live in the region. Between our Aleut history and Alaska Natives in progress lies the punctuation mark which serves as the native space of belonging within the development of Alaska. To further explore this notion of belonging, the manuscript looks at how moments after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, a company executive promised to, quote, we will keep you whole, end quote, to the environment and to the cultures of, of southern Alaska. From the extinction of the sea cow to the collapse of the sea otter to the rise of the fishing industrial complex and the gold rush, is there a uh, is there a funding endowment or a government policy that could, make, could keep whole the harm done by cultures and to ecosystems in the last three centuries? The grief expressed by native chiefs and artists, the book argues, reflect uh, grievance for the loss faced during the spill, but also to the history that has led to such devastation. At the time of the oil spill, the government had yet to formally recognize the inherent sovereign rights to property for Alaska natives. Even well-meaning political leaders at the federal level lamented for the cultural dystopia felt by Alaska Native citizens. Only after the spill in the 1990s did the federal government recognize Alaska Native sovereignty, allowing all Native villages to organize as tribal entities. Uh, this proved the first time that the United States had tried to come to terms with Alaska Native sovereignty at all. The manuscript grows more interested in the notion of belonging and the nation through seeing how the United States incorporates Alaska Native history into a larger national into a, uh, the larger narrative of national progress. In 2012, President Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin commemorated the 200th anniversary of a former Russian colony in California, now called California, uh, Fort Ross California State Park, constructed on a Miwok village of uh, Manatee. The park sits al uh, along the Sonoma coastline about 70 miles north of San Francisco. Has anyone ever been there before? Oh, this is, isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad to see this. Um, amid their 2012 meeting, Obama, uh, si uh, Obama signified Fort Ross as an example of the long history uh, between the two nations, yet the facts are that the colony closed before the United States had actually entered into California. Drawing on the theme of belonging, the book examines Alaska Native participation, how Alaska Native participation is emphasized in the performance of history at the park. Alaska Natives made up the majority of the residents with a rotating population of about 120 for more than three decades of the colony's tenure in California. The book then turns to, exa uh, turns to examine uh, the blessing of the fleet ceremony conducted uh, during Cultural Celebration uh, Day at Force Ross in 2006 and 2013 by actual Russian Orthodox priests and individuals dressed to appear as Aleuts. The priests bless the costume players as they paddle their kayaks to the coastline. The performance reverses history by setting the priests at the shore and the native Alaskans arriving to meet them. <laughs> For in the 18th and 19th century, indigenous people greeted Russians on their arrival to the shores of the Americas, right? Um, also, the costume players lend the impression that the native people are not around to take part in the celebration, and in a strange way that mystifies the colony's intent, which was the coercing of native hunters to kill sea otters for their pelts. The mammal by the mid-19th century was thought extinct by the tremendous demands of the Russian-American company. 
Natives coerced by the Russian-American company formed, uh, formed Russian-America in California, yet this performance, uh, in this performance they have all but vanished, much like the sea otter. To locate an indigenous experience at Fort Ross, the book turns to a song composed by an Alaska native who worked there in the 19th century. The lyrics expressed his feelings towards the compulsory nature of his time there and that he felt like he would never return home to Alaska. The song locates how the United States and Russia have employed natives to build their presence in Alaska, of which I call first space, the uh, basic building block of Alaska, first space, uh, composed through you know, indigenous labor and indigenous, indigenous geographies. Um, these spaces inhabited by uh, Alaska natives is what I want to speak more about today in the second part of the talk, where I will read a passage from the manuscript entitled Extraction's Standard Bearer. <coughs> Excuse me. The figure of John Benny Benson, an Alutic from the village of Chicknick, articulates this space of belonging for Alaska natives within the development of Alaska by the means of natural resource industries. Throughout the present day state of Alaska, streets and institutions bear either the name or likeness of John Benny Benson, more so perhaps than any other person in the region's modern his political history. Unlike historical indigenous figures in the contiguous part of the United States, however, Benson's fame derives not from his armed resistance to a um, expanding settler nation, nor from his involvement as a signatory of treaties. Rather, at the age of 13, an orphan, Benson designed the Alaska flag, a symbol of the meeting point between indigenous people and the United States through the environment. The first public representation of Benny Benson to circulate consists of a photograph attached to his design submission in the Alaska Territorial Flag Contest of 1927 when he was a child. Alaska school children throughout the territory participated in the competition with the aspirations of winning a new wristwatch and a $1,000 scholarship from the American Legion, uh, the fraternal organization that sponsored the competition. A black and white photograph of a 13-year-old Benson adheres to a sheet of vellum on which he sketched the flag design. In fact, all submissions included photographs of the entrance, allowing Anglo judges to view images of young designers as they reviewed the 141 contest entries. Benson's photographic portrait presents a cheerful young Benny, seated with his hands clasped over one knee, smiling for the camera. Beneath the image reads a brief narrative in his handwriting that details the concept behind the design. The blue field is Quote, the blue field is for the sky, uh, for the Alaska sky, and the, and the forget-me-not, an Alaskan flower, end quote. Bringing attention to the midnight sky and the region's flora, Benson further expands on the ideas behind the flag, writing, quote, the North Star is for the future of the state, the most northerly in the Union, end quote. Please note that Benson's Alaska would not actually become a state in the Union for another 30 years. Nonetheless, his design insists Alaska's joining was imminent. Represented on the right side of the flag, the North Star, or the Polaris, referenced in the passage, is a universal datum used to navigate the world's oceans. In this way, the North Star relates to uh, Uganda and um, uh, Unanga and Aleutic cultures renowned for their seamanship throughout the Pacific and Bering regions, since even before the arrival of the Russians. Benson's pattern, the North Star, assuming dominance as the principal gold emblem in the flag, evidences the young man's understanding that the territory was intended to become a state in the Union. For Benson, the incorporation of the Great Land fully into the United States is a destiny that's literally written in the stars. From, Benson's de uh, from reading Benson's description, one can see uh, to the extent from which he drew upon his Aleutic heritage for the design of the flag. For example, he writes, quote, the dipper is for the great bear symbolizing strength, end quote. And it's represented here by the seven st gold stars in the middle of the flag. The Western constellation uh, known as the Big Dipper is an asterism of the seventh, seven brightest stars of Ursa Major, also known in subarctic indigenous cultures as the great bear. 
Benson would, of course, spend his adult life living b beside real Kodiak bears on Kodiak Island, uh, across from the Shelikov Strait of his birth home. The Kodiak bear, or Tahkuka, translated as the great bear in the Aleutic language, is the largest brown bear in North America and is a symbol of resources and culture understood as intimately linked to Aleutic people themselves. In the flag design, the universal meaning of the stellar formation as the dipper, understood by non-natives and other Americans, combines with the indigenous meaning of the great bear. The, for, uh, the Westerners, the constellation in, embodied the, exactive, the extractive national project of, Alaska, of the Alaska region with the dipper's um, scoop leveled downward as if burdened with a heavy load of fish or gold. Colonialism's grand shovel removing, places, uh, removing resources to elsewhere in the world, right? Um, the visual double entendre of the Dipper and the Great Bear expressed Benson's aspirations for, uh, for Alaska as a state in the making, with origins in the indigenous presence, but also with universal rights and inclusions for all Alaskans in the larger nation state. The flag, a meeting point for both a national and an indigenous future within the United States exact extractive project by shaping the state of Alaska in the Great Land. Benson, the orphan child, worked as metonymy for an orphan territory the nation was to adopt on its own, as its own. As an adjunct for the territory, his narrative becomes Alaska, Alaska's own narrative. Images of John Benny Benson as a child and an adult alongside his flag circulated in newspapers as the territory moved towards statehood in 1959 and continued uh, well after his passing in 1972. The photographs are helpful in understanding how Alaska natives as citizens of the polis polity transgressed hardline visions of in settler indigenous nationalisms with their participation in the construction of the state. The double meaning of the constellation as the Dipper and the Great Bear conveys how on one hand Alaska's indigenous peoples are voting citizens, but on the other they are sovereign entities whose indigenous cultures precede the durable national project. Um, yet throughout this time period, uh, the state and the federal governments continued to deny native sovereignty. This narrative of national inclusion possessed such strength that some historians have even placed the burden of colonialism on Alaska natives themselves. One such historian co correlates the presumed native willingness uh, with what he perceived as the native inability to value indigenous sovereignty. The historian writes, quote, unlike other colonial areas, Alaska was not inhabited by a large native population, militantly conscious of its cultural heritage and capable of developing a movement from, uh, for freedom from colonialism, end quote. In this suspect view, the inevitability of Americanization becomes the result of indigenous peoples not preferring their own systems of government to that of United States democracy. Through the ward guardian trope that's so apparent in this observation, the writer casts Alaska's people as innocents who are incapable of active political responses to annexation. Contrary to this view, Alaska Native political activism is laced throughout the historical record of Alaska. Alaska Natives have worked as individuals through collective, uh, and through collective action to be recognized as sovereign people and as members of the state. For instance, the establishment of the Alaska Native Brotherhood founded in 1912 and the Alaska Native Sisterhood in 1915 marked an indigenous determination to be involved with a government unwilling to acknowledge Native sovereignty. The book argues that Alaska Native politics have always revolved around this doubleness of citizenship and sovereignty. As Benny's prediction of an Alaska state implied, there was a movement for statehood led by non-Native non political leaders in the early 20th century, but it met with strong opposition from Senate and congressional actors at the national level. Critics of statehood noted the sparse uh, excuse me, uh, noted, noted the sparse population in the territory and questioned the appropriateness of Alaska as a state in the American Union. Members of Alaska's non-native population thought that counting natives as part of the citizenry leading to greater numbers would help transform the territory finally into a state. 
While the United States bestow, bestowed citizenship on all indigenous peoples in 1924, 1925, the national spokespersons, uh, nas some national spokespersons believed Alaska Natives incapable of acting as functioning citizens. Uh, there was in fact a movement in the early 1920s to establish what's called Southeastern Alaskan as a separate territory because that's where the majority of white residents lived. Um, uh, this is a uh, slide of, of Benny with his daughter Charlotte and uh, the Governor Egan after statehood. Egan is the first uh, uh, state governor of Alaska after it became, after the territory became a state. Um, local, uh, ter local Alaskan territorial leaders contested um, a lot of these arguments and insisted on including natives in the population count and in the pol political bod body more broadly. Carl Floss, a prominent local Alaskan politician in the 1950s, uh, wrote, quote, in order to foster at an early date a homogeneous state, the Indian Bureau should be eliminated and natives assimilated into the citizenry, end quote. While many thought that promoting natives as civilized would justify eventual statehood, opponents in the lower 48 threatened to disregard the indigenous in counting territorial population. Former territorial governor uh, Ernest Greening claimed that, quote, one senator who was unadulterably opposed to statehood would analyze our populations based on the 1950 census and throw out the native as not being civilized, end quote. Thus, representations of native, civilized natives proved vital to the territorial government in the development of a platform for statehood. Alaska Native people in the mid 20th century, like Benson, are frequently pictured as welcoming an asymmetrical political system, trading their homelands for the benefit of American citizenship. Reading the images for their meanings of belonging, natives stand as part of a broad discourse at work amid the United States territorialization. Uh, this, the photograph of a village celebration over the 1959 statehood called Jumping for Joy, taken from Ernest Gruning's papers, serves as an example uh, of this portrayal. The passage below the photograph reads when, quote, the news of statehood reached the Arctic village of Kotzebue, the town started jumping, end quote. In the image behind four men playing drums, a village partakes in the blanket toss where one villager, Laura May Belts, displays, quote, an American flag that will soon have a star for her native land, end quote. Belts, the woman high in the air, represents the welcoming subject amid the tradition of the blanket toss. The display of the American flag in her hand naturalizes American culture for, nations, for the nation's expansion into the North through the meshing of indigenous cultural practices with the very American flag. To the eye, of course, the drummers seem to be offering belts to the nation. In the decades following Alaska's adoption of Benson's flag and statehood, his celebrity spread well beyond the rapidly growing village of, his, of Kodiak, his adult home, to the greater U.S. population. There are photographs of Benny at various political functions, standing beside or holding his flag with local and national political leaders. One image here, uh, Benson hands a copy of an illustrated children's book about his life called Benny's Flag. Uh, to the winner of a Miss Seafair contest at a community festival in Seattle, Washington in the 1960s. While the two figures on the right, adorned in fur coats, embody the rugged image of the American Northwest, Benson, the indigenous citizen, wears a two-button sports jacket displaying his uh, civilized nature. Another image of Benson and the flag articulates Alaska Natives' position in the racial culture and gender hierarchy of the United States. This photograph weighs the status of Alaska Native citizenry in contrast to a woman of color working as a nurse in Seattle. Written by Yul Chafin for a book about Kodiak, the passage accompanying the photograph reads, quote, Kodiak would like to claim one of her citizens as her very own, but Benny Benson really belongs to all of Alaska, end quote. The picture displays a mature Benson presenting, quote, one of his autographed flags to a pretty Seattle nurse, end quote. Benson in the composition dons the sports jacket seen in the previous image and a trimmed mustache. 
smiles for the camera while holding one side of a creased Alaska state flag with his signature on it. The nurse on the other side of the flag is also smiling for the camera. Both are presented as domestic subjects where Binney enjoys the fruit of Alaska's Americanization. Asserting the claim of the civilized Alaska native, the corresponding passage um, notes that when Binney designed the flag, he, quote, predicted that Alaska would become a state, end quote. This photograph links the indigenous subjects of the United States expansion into the North in contrast to a non-white woman placing, a, uh, placing the proud indigenous citizen who, who predicted Alaska's rise uh, to statehood is situated by race and gender above the nurse, uh, reminiscent of how industry actively fulfilled a national need for healthcare workers through the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 or the Hart Keller Act. Uh, this passage allowed, um, allowed women, uh, many women from the Philippines to be trained as nurses to work stateside. So uh, both of these variegatedly civilized subjects, the nurse, and, or uh, Benson and the unnamed nurse, reflect the gendered imaginations of empire as well as the coercive culture of the ward-guardian relationship. She is in the gendered role of the caregiver, while Benson conversely embodies the masculine spaces of the frozen north. Putting forth the preconception of Alaska as a gendered masculine space the Arct and Arctic people as subordinate but superior to other non-whites and capable of achieving a higher level of civilization, and perhaps even as fleeting honorary whites who are entitled to be served by other non-white subjects. <clears throat> These imaginings carry over to the image of Benson and the unnamed nurse by championing United States notions of patriarchy intrinsic to the proposition that Alaska became a state because the indigenous population, unlike those in other national colonies, was characteristically assimilable to a gendered nationalism. Benson, uh, the named subject in the photo, while the nurse, unknown, holds the other side of the flag without a story or without a name. By giving the flag to her, he is, in, he is in fact imparting a bit of civilization. While Alaska natives are presented in contrast to other people of color, Benny is also presented at odds with the hurtful betrayals of tribal people in the contiguous part of the nation. He is pic pictured as welcoming expansion, not fighting it. In this way, Benson uh, and the nurse convey the success of United States projects well beyond its contiguous borders, a softer relationship between the United States and indigenous peoples elsewhere, a promise that Alaska would be, part, uh, be a part of the nation without the heartening battles that, of manifest destinies pushed to the Pacific Ocean. In 1927, shortly after Benson's design uh, won the contest, Clinkett's civil rights leader, lawyer, and newspaper publisher, William Paul, the sole Alaska native in the territorial legislature, proposed the law designating Benny's flag as the official flag. Benson's description of the flag, or Paul, excuse me, Paul's description of the flag became the inspiration for the song Alaska's Flag, written in the 1950s by Mary, uh, native, non native Mary, Louis, Mary Drake, excuse me. The significant aspect of Alaska's flag is that the lyrics, oh, oh, I did it. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, Paul's action to wreck, uh, the, the lyrics do not mention John Benny Benson in any way. I don't expect you to read this, uh, and I will not uh, read it for you, but um, the, the uh, lyrics do not mention uh, Benny at all. Um, Paul's action to recognize the flag positions indigeneity in Alaska as non-oppositional non to a formalized Alaskan state government. Yet the lyrics of the song deny the, com the compelled native participation in its activities. Um, decades later in 1987, Carol Beavis Davis a uh, non-indigenous musician pr proposed a second verse to the song in an attempt to recognize Benson and native culture's, culture, excuse me, culture's role in the formation of the state. The verse submitted to the state legislature every year from 1987 to 2011 um, reads as follows. A native lad chose our dipper's stars for Alaska's flag there'll be no bars. Among our cultures, be it known, 
Through years, our native's past has grown. To share our treasures hand in hand, to keep Alaska our great land. We love the northern midnight sky, our mountains, lakes, and streams nearby. Our great North Star with its steady light will guide our cultures clear and bright. With nature's flag to Alaskans dear, the simple flag of the last frontier. While Davis's verse seeks to include John Benny Benson and the region's indigenous people more broadly, in doing so, the piece overlooks the colonial aspect of the state when she refers to Alaska as the last frontier. This is because for the indigenous culture she seeks to recognize, Alaska proves less a frontier than it does an actual homeland. The concept of Alaska as, a, as the last frontier, however, served to reopen a sense of economic opportunity foreclosed at the end of the 19th century uh, California gold rush when Alaska was found to be in possession of such valuable natural resources. A second verse, uh, also, the second verse also doesn't note Benson or Paul's role in ma making the flag an official symbol of Alaska by name as it does at least acknowledge native culture. Regretfully, the legislature, however, has repeatedly denied adding the verse to the official record. In response, Alaska Native State Senator Albert Kukish testified uh, to the Senate that historically any and all legislation mentioning the word native has never been passed into law. He, has pointed, this, uh, he pointed this out as he was speaking to his fellow lawmakers about adding, adding the second verse. Quote, he says, if you adopt something like this, it doesn't give Alaska Natives any kind of advantage in the state. It doesn't make us sovereign. It doesn't give us a heads up or a leg up in business abilities in the state. It doesn't make us any stronger. But it, it does help lift our face just a little bit. In, the culture, uh, in our culture, people tell us, when you do good things, you lift the face of your people, end quote. Kukesh's statements emphasize the importance of recognizing elastic native culture and thereby openly discuss it, the doubleness they face in formal state politics as citizens, indigenous citizens that developed Alaska, but also as belonging to cultures sovereign and distinct from the United States. Native investment in Alaska, however, does not disqualify their sovereignty, even though the law uh, until recently denied their assertions of so native self-determination. Um, for after Alaska adopted the flag, uh, Alaska Natives as citizens helped pass the, an Anti-Discrimination Act in 1950, 1945, but a decade later, the Teoton case in 1955 at the Supreme Court denied Alaska Native rights to their resources uh, under, uh, under the law because uh, the court said that the uh, Congress had failed to recognize that such rights existed. Uh, this photograph is of a Clinkett civil rights activist, Elizabeth Peratrovich, uh, and her husband, Roy, at the signing of the Anti-Discrimination Act by Governor Greening in 1945. The Teton case involved, involved a village filing a Fifth Amendment taking against the United States involving, a timber, uh, involving timber in the Tongass National Forest. Um, so in the end, the anti-discrimination law that was meant to protect citizens from bias proved not to shield native citizens in their property holdings because they were in fact indigenous, right? It, it, it was discriminatory against their indigenous holdings. After balancing civil rights with indigenous rights, the Great Land Manuscript further explores indigenous property rights and belonging through a series of letters written in the 1970s by Inupiat Fred Big Jim to Howard Rock, an Inupiat artist and the editor of the native newspaper, The Tundra Times. Big Jim's letters question the rise of native corporations that emerged as part of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971 that were meant to extinguish any native claims held on natural resources so the petroleum industry could develop in the Alaska's North Slope. The settlement initiated 13 regional and hundreds of village for-profit corporations that, unlike tribal governments, issued stock to native shareholders while holding parcels of land untaxed unless they were developed in some way. The initial idea that the corporations would develop their lands to earn profit for their native shareholders. So Big Jim's letters to Howard signify how natives are still participants in an asymmetrical endeavor involving their relationship to the environment. 
Interestingly enough, the corporations eerily resemble the rise of the organization man in non-native culture, which William White and uh, Vine Deloria Jr. Found in, the, found in the nation's abandonment of the myth of the rugged individual. The organiza organization man is a term sociologist William White used to describe how people were defining success through their involvement in corporations, casting aside the fantasy that they could be successful on their own. The government's creation of native corporations is reflective of how non-native culture imagined itself at the time while refusing to acknowledge native sovereignty. Uh, this is the map of the 12 regional corporations and the, uh, the 13th corporation, regional corporation is in Seattle, oddly enough. Um, we can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, in closing this talk, the book's epilogue the Land of Grace follows the 2006 Alaska Native re, uh, Village rejection of um, President, uh, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez's offer of free heating oil on the basis that he, while quoting Noam Chomsky, described President George W. Bush as the devil while speaking at a United Nations summit. The situation allows the book to end considering how two of the largest oil producers in the Americas have faced an economic collapse in the 21st century. In that, in that, I ask, what will mark native belonging in the decline of the state's petroleum industry? Oh, I did it again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kuyana. Thank you.